Theology of Public Life, Lessons for Lot in the City of Sodom. And this morning, we are continuing through this first section in our study. And uh, again, talking about the relationship of the Christian uh, to the state. And um, most recently, I guess by way of review, we'll begin with that. Uh, most recently, we have uh, introduced the biblical concept, the biblical concept of jurisdiction. Uh, from juris meaning law, diction meaning to speak. Um, jurisdiction refers to the authority to the God-given authority to speak the law within a, a given sphere of responsibility. And right, we talked about Abraham Kuyper's um, um, thoughts on sphere sovereignty, helps us to understand that. Uh, but from that biblical concept of jurisdiction, <clears throat> we discussed then a false or an unbiblical application of that concept uh, used by our government today, used by public institutions, social institutions today to cancel or silence any moral influence on the part of the church uh, from the sphere of the church. Um, and that is the false dichotomy or the separation between the church and the state. And we looked at why that was false. We looked at the details um, with respect to that, the, the biblical, how we are to biblically understand that. I was reading something this week and uh, in what I was reading, uh, he was talking about the um, that there was no separation between church and state in the Bible. It's just not true. Uh, we see that those jurisdictional spheres of authority present even in the theocracy of Israel between the, um, the priesthood, uh, the king, um, between civil, judicial, moral law. And so um, those judicial or jurisdictional spheres of authority uh, even present in Old Testament Israel so there has been, there is a separation, a proper biblical separation between uh, church and state, and that's to be um, uh, our founding fathers intended that to be mirrored uh, in the separation of church and state that we find in our own government. Um, finally, in talking about that issue of church and state and how um, state was never to operate to the exclusion of God, or the uh, influence of the church uh, in the, the operation of the civil authorities. Finally, we began to look at the, the proper biblical relationship then between those spheres of authority uh, using Abraham Kuyper's writing on sphere sovereignty. Uh, we considered the sphere of the state, uh, the social sphere, there's the sphere of the church, and then the sphere of the individual, and Kuyper tends to blend uh, the sphere of the church and the individual together. So now this morning then, in continuing thinking about this. And what we're doing is we're gradually over time, we want to understand our circumstances. We did that at the beginning, um, an introduction to that. We want to now think through uh, our relationship to governing authorities, civil authorities. We're beginning to introduce that. And so this morning we want to begin unpacking uh, a critical text uh, from the Bible to help us further understand the relationship between the spheres, okay? Um, and that text is Romans chapter 13, verses one through seven. Today is going to be a Romans fiesta. <laughs> Romans in Sunday school, Romans during the church service, looking forward to it. It's a joy to be in the book of Romans. Um, in particular, for Romans 13, we want to look at the sphere of the church and the sphere of the state or the sphere of the individual as the individual relates to the sphere of the state. And this is going to take us a couple of weeks, probably a few weeks, um, to work through this text. And uh, we'll get to, as we work through the text... Uh, more and more implications from the text uh, that will help us understand what Paul intends by this statement, okay, by this um, paragraph here in Romans 13. Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as Peter would say later, <laughs> has written to us of these things in which are some things hard to understand, um, which untaught and unstable people have twisted to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. Uh, so we want to take what Paul is writing here. We want to understand what Paul is writing. We want to clearly understand what is not being said and then clearly understand what is being said. And we'll do that um, as we work verse by verse through the, through the passage. This passage has been prevalently, pervasively over time, twisted, misrepresented. And so we're calling this segment um, of a theology of public life, writing wrongs from Romans, All right? We want to uh, clarify a biblical understanding of this text and right some of those interpretational wrongs that have been imposed on the text over uh, a long period of time, in particular in our day and age, right? These, these things were, I was, I was reading um, 
uh, Vindicie Contra Tyrannus uh, some this week. Uh, we're going to get into that book later in this study. Um, but he was uh, making comments. Uh, this was early in the history of the church uh, after the Reformation, uh, early, and um, making comments about uh, the sphere of the state and the sphere of the state encroaching on the sphere of the church. And uh, we've, our brothers and sisters from centuries past have just been compelled to think more clearly about these things because of their circumstances. Uh, we less so because we've enjoyed um, a blessing over um, the entirety of our lives, the blessing of not being persecuted by the government for our faith. Uh, those times are, are changing, but um, uh, we do, do need to address these issues and we need to think about them rightly. And we're going to draw on help from those brothers as we go. Uh, many believe that the Bible teaches, or they act as though the Bible teaches, absolute obedience to civil authorities. Or they interpret texts like Romans 13 in such a way that undermines the lordship of Jesus Christ, or the headship, if you will, the sovereignty, the absolute sovereignty of God over all civil governments. And so they interpret Romans 13 in a way that undermines that sovereign authority, the sovereign authority of God. It's not as simple as to say that we obey God, uh, we obey government in all things, um, except for when the government calls us to disobey God. That's, a, I think, a very simplistic way of interpreting Romans chapter 13. And we're going to see why as we break down the details of the text. Um, it's just not quite that simple. And there are many ways in which today, even in our current context, we're not being actively persecuted uh, right now uh, as a church uh, by the government. There are churches uh, just to the north of us uh, who are <laughs> actively being persecuted by their government um, for worship. Um, and they've got uh, tough decisions to make. And um, their road a little more difficult than ours is right now. I think that's going to uh, creep south. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll trust the Lord with all that when that comes. But um, we have a tendency to look too simplistically at an application of Romans chapter 13. And I think in looking at Romans 13 too simplistically, the Christian is um, tempted to or prone to undermine the true lordship of Jesus Christ over civil authorities by failing to take a stand where we should be taking a stand to um, restrict, resist tyranny. And so um, we're going to look at that. We're going to get uh, some clarity, I hope, in looking at this text together over the next several weeks. All right, let's read the text together. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, writing wrongs from Romans. Verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, Custom, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Okay, Romans chapter 13, uh, after explaining the problem of man's sin, after explaining the, the glorious remedy provided by God through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's essentially the first 12 chapters of the book of Romans, the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, Paul then begins to lay out the implications of the gospel for the Christian life. Uh, we begin to see in the book of Romans, really in chapter 12 forward, imperatives, right? Paul lays out these, these glory, glorious indicatives, these statements of fact, these assertions of truth in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, basically an explanation of the gospel, an exposition of the gospel and justification by faith alone in Christ alone. 
Uh, and then in laying out those glorious assertions of truth, then Paul begins to lay out the implications of that, which is how we are to live. So he begins in chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice. That is our reasonable service to God, considering all of those glorious truths. We're going to talk about a related subject uh, to that this morning in our text in Romans uh, during the sermon. Uh, chapter 12, verse 3, love one another. Chapter 12, verse 14, love your enemies. And then in chapter 13, verse 1, be subject to governing authorities and so on. Okay, So being subject to governing authorities in chapter 13, verse 1 is part of now Paul's working out all of that good theology and how it's to impact how we are to live, right? How we are to live. And I think it's incumbent upon us as subject to God, as our absolute sovereign, subject to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that we are dutiful and faithful subjects of the governing authorities, right? Um, God wants to his people to testify of their submissiveness to his own absolute authority by submitting ourselves to governing authorities. And we'll talk about that. All right. So then now considering the context of Romans 13, Paul is writing to a people, to a church here that is living under the rule of the Roman empire. And if you think about that with me for a moment, what that entails, uh, their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, living as Christians under the rule of the Roman empire, raised serious questions regarding how they were to relate um, to the government, uh, how they are to relate particularly to civil authorities, and even how they're to relate more broadly to the social sphere, um, they had increased in their time uh, this increased responsibility, this increased accountability for how they were to interrelate with the state because of the government that they were living under, the persecution, the difficulty that they were living under. Uh, Paul describes in this context living under probably the most suppressive, repressive, oppressive <laughs> regimes in all of human history, the Roman Empire, Paul describes the posture of the Christian, how the Christian is to relate, so to speak, to the civil authority in Rome. Um, in doing so now, and what we don't want to neglect from Romans 13, is at the same time, Paul describes what should be the posture of the civil authorities, what the posture of the government should be too. And so in doing this in Romans 13, Paul is essentially laying out the way that things should be, uh, the way the, um, the, the Christian ideal, if you will, um, for both the Christian and in their relationship to civil authorities, but also with respect to the state and how the state is to operate under the authority of God. Okay, we see both, uh, even though the emphasis here is an imperative to believers for how they are to interact with the state. Okay, so we want to talk about this under a few points. The first is the source of government, governmental authority. We're going to talk about the source of governmental authority. We'll talk about um, the substance of that governmental authority, which will be next week, and that's really, really important. And then we'll talk about um, implications, obligations, commitments uh, from the text that Paul lays out for us, okay? So let's talk first about the source of governmental authority. I think this is going to be very clear to us. Verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for or because there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. All right, from verse 1, Paul, we want to talk about an imperative that Paul gives. That's a commandment, an imperative. An indicative, which is a statement of fact, all right? And we want to talk about instances and implications. We want to keep our customary pattern of alliteration going. We've not failed yet, in the, so help us remember. Imperative, indicative, instances, and implications, okay? So let's talk about the imperative first. The imperative in verse 1 is this. Let every soul, right, every soul be subject to the governing authorities. That's a command. It's in the imperative. Literally, from the Greek, it's translated every soul to surpassing or higher authorities be subject, right, be subject. Every soul to surpassing or higher authorities be subject. That verb be subject is a present passive imperative, right? Present meaning it's ongoing. Passive, it's something that we do passive. We are being subject, so to speak. We've submitted ourselves and it's a command. The word be subject refers to being willing 
or being inclined to submit to orders or to submit to commands. Uh, being subject, notice that Paul doesn't say uh, obey. He could have said, let every soul obey the governing authorities. And elsewhere, uh, Titus in particular uses the word obey. Peter uses the word be submissive. Here, Paul uses the term be subject, be submissive, right? There's a, a reason I believe that Paul doesn't say strictly obey, but he says be submissive, be subject. That word for be subject, that verb expresses a willingness, expresses a desire, an inclination, a heart disposition um, to obey, to submit. Rather than the more active obey, this is a more passive willingness on the part of the Christian to be submissive, to be subject to higher or surpassing authorities. Uh, it's not referring strictly or solely. We would, we would say it's not referring merely to obedience, uh, not merely a yielding, if you will, but a willingness, a heart disposition to submit, a heart disposition ready to be obedient, ready to be, uh, to follow commands, right? And the for there, the indicative or the statement of fact, statement of truth is for the sake of honoring the Lord who appointed that authority. It's for the sake of the Lord. The duty required from verse one is submission, right? The duty required is submission. Uh, Matthew Henry uh, defines that as loyalty, respect. He describes it as obedience to just laws and commands, right? Um, subject to legal penalties. Uh, when you are submissive to the government and you disobey the government, you're, you're subjecting yourself to um, legal penalties, legal sanctions. Not unlike when you join the church, for example. We um, practice church discipline. Uh, church discipline is there for our good. The Lord appoints that practice for our good. And so when we come to join the church, we are submitting ourselves to church discipline. Why? Because it's for our good, right? Um, this, the governing authorities appointed by God are ministers for good. Uh, as a citizen of that country, so to speak, when you're submissive to governing authorities, you're submitting yourself to penal, penal sanctions, penalties, punishments related to breaking the law. You're saying, I am willing to sit, submit myself to this law. I'm willing to submit myself to those penalties, okay? So the, the duty required in all of this is submission. Notice also, I think it's important the way that Henry describes that, is that it's submission to just laws and commands, obedience to just laws uh, and commands, not just any laws and commands. Now, what comes to mind when I think about that is the submission that a wife voluntarily gives her husband, right? The submission of a wife to her husband is not coerced at the tip of a sword <laughs> or at the crack of a whip, is it? Uh, the, the, the submission that a wife biblically gives to her husband is a voluntary submission. And the husband sacrificially is to love his wife. So that submission is voluntary. Uh, the wife voluntarily submits to her husband. And so the wife has a heart disposition. She has a willingness before the Lord to desire obedience. But obedience to every single command? No, I would, with Henry, qualify that to say obedience to just commands, right? Um, we know, and we can use, again, that sort of... Um, simple understanding that we're to obey God rather than men. So if a husband were to uh, give an unjust, an unlawful command um, that is contrary to the law of God, the faithful, biblically submissive wife would be just and right to resist obedience to that command, wouldn't she? Right? She would be obeying God rather than men by resisting that unjust, unrighteous, unlawful, unbiblical command on the part of her husband, and at the same time is herself a submissive wife. Do you see? So there, there is a sense in which, and we, as we talk about this idea of Paul um, commanding that we are to be subject to governing authorities, that sometimes being submissive and being subject does not entail obedience, right? Oftentimes it does entail obedience, but I think the distinction that has to be made at the outset here is that it's obedience to just laws and commands, okay? We're going to talk about that more as we get into the text. I can think of several examples of that in scripture. Um, obviously the relationship between a husband and his wife, I think, is a good example of that kind of submission, the submission that's called for, the obedience that's called for, uh, but I think of other examples in scripture um, with closer respect to the governing authorities. And one of those that comes to mind is, is Paul with King Saul, 
right? And Paul, what is Paul doing uh, during the first part of his uh, relationship there with King Saul? Paul is uh, disobeying the governing authority. Uh, he's not showing up when he's supposed to show up. Why? Because he's in fear for his life. Saul is going to kill him, right? Saul has no biblical right to take the life of, of am I saying Paul? <laughs> David. <laughs> got Paul on the brain. <laughs> so, no, in no. Thank you, brother. Yeah, give me the benefit of the doubt. Fill in the gaps for me. Yes. <laughs> yes. David. <laughs> David, we got our testaments all interwoven here, mixed up. Um, uh, David's running for his life, right? Uh, Saul has no biblical authority, no authority as king. There is no divine right of kings that Saul is exercising to take David's life, all right? It's a... Um, Saul doesn't have that authority. So David rightly resists the authorities. But David has a heart disposition, doesn't he, of submission, right? A heart disposition, willing, desirous, desirous of submitting to Saul as king. If Saul would just do right, uh, would deal justly. Uh, so we see examples of that in David's own actions, right? In the, in the, in the cave, when Saul comes in to uh, relieve himself and David and his mighty men are hiding in the cave, uh, David has an opportunity at that moment to take Saul's life, right? And what does David do? Um, he honors the Lord by respecting the authority that God had given to Saul, um, but he doesn't just um, submit his life to Saul to do with, to do with it as Saul pleases, um, David resists by fleeing, protecting his own life. And in doing that, he's, he's keeping the sixth commandment, isn't he? Um, and uh, he cuts off the corner of Saul's robe to show him his loyalty, his fealty uh, to the king and to country, right? It, it, as uh, Henry states, his loyalty, his respect, and then his willingness to obey just laws and commands. Um, Paul in the courtyard of the high priest is another example. Uh, you whitewashed him. Then he realized uh, what the law said, and he retracted his statement out of respect, not for that wicked man in the position of the high priest, but for the institution of the high priesthood, right? There is this respect, this loyalty that the law affords that position, even though there have been some very wicked, ungodly men who have held that position. Paul um, was respectful, had a heart disposition, a willingness to be loyal, to be respectful of that position. Does that make sense? The, the, um, in other words, uh, if Paul would have said, Romans chapter 13, verse 1, obey the governing authorities in all things, I, I think it leaves, it would have left out that nuance, that understanding of what be subject communicates. Okay. Let me, um, before we go any further with this, let me just ask, are there any questions with respect to that? We're on the same page. Okay. Um, the context then there's a context to Paul's statement in verse one, uh, not unlike today, not unlike the context we find ourselves in today. This was spoken in a context of many who despised authority, All right? This was spoken in a context. Oh, Brian. Sorry. Oh, it's okay, brother. Go ahead, man. <laughs> I need to give you longer time to think. I, I was thinking about David and mm -hmm. Saul. Would he have been justified to take Saul's life at any time? Like there, there, he did say, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Mm -hmm. And there was Saul trying to, you know, kill him. David knew that he was going to be king at some point. Yeah. Would he have been justified at any point if he would have decided to end Saul's life? Or was he obligated to not? Yeah, I think, I think uh, that's a really good question, brother. I think David is a, a very good example and a very good testimony of going to the extent that we can to avoid that very thing, right? I think um, we in keeping with the sixth commandment and in keeping with, I think, biblical instruction elsewhere, we have not only the right, but the responsibility to um, protect our own life, um, even to the degree of taking life to do it, right? And self-defense is the, uh, in other words, we have a right to self-defense. Um, I think when um, I was asked a question a while back about uh, the Lord's teaching in Matthew chapter five, the Sermon on the Mount, and turn the other cheek. Um, what turn the other cheek does not mean 
is it does not mean this blind acceptance of whatever somebody does to me. Like I have no um, duty, no responsibility to defend myself. Um, it's accept the dishonor, accept the, um, be willing to, um, in Hebrews, in the hall of faith, uh, those um, faithful brothers and sisters accepted, joyfully accepted the plundering of their goods, right? Joyfully accepted um, the persecution even of their lives for the sake of honoring the Lord and honoring their testimony to the gospel. And so I think in texts like uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, or even in David's example, I think it's, it's um, faithful, good, righteous, and just for the Christian to give excellent testimony of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our faith in God, by doing all that we can um, to respect and to honor uh, in this case, the institution of the king in the way that God has called us to. But I think that had Saul um, drawn his sword and come at David, David would have had not only the right, but the responsibility to protect his own life. Make sense? So I think, um, again, David had opportunity in that cave not to do that. And so in choosing to honor the Lord and choosing to trust the Lord, right? And you think about David's frame of mind too in that entirely trusting the Lord. He knew he would be king. But he was going to be king at God's doing, not his own doing. He's not going to take matters into his own hands. We see other examples of that in Scripture where matters are taken into their own hands. Abraham is, a, is an example that comes to mind for me where, you know, pretend you're my sister, right? Or um, child of promise and I'm a really old guy and so I'm going to lie with Hagar to take matters into my own hands. And there's a, a failure on the part of Abraham to trust the Lord in that. Whereas we see a good testimony of David trusting the Lord in that that help answer the question? There, again, it goes back to that issue too. There is a responsibility, not only a responsibility, but a right, a duty on the part of the Christian to preserve their life. Uh, we're going to get to that when we talk about our own government and the Declaration of Independence, uh, the Bill of Rights, um, where we have uh, the right to the inalienable right. Inal inalienable rights are those rights given to us by God. They're not given to us by the government. They're rights given to us by God. And the Christian has both the duty and the responsibility to defend those rights and not to allow them to be taken. Why? Because they're given, a, given us by God and we're stewards of them. We're stewards of those rights. So they're not to be taken from us. And one of those, chief among those, is the right to life, right? And we'll talk about this more when we get there. But any other thoughts or questions with respect to that? Okay, we'll flesh that out more. Um, this was Romans chapter 13, verse 1, uh, spoken in a context of many in that day and age who despised authority, who rejected authority, who um, there were those in the Lord's day, uh, the zealots who were um, actively fighting against the government, um, despising the authority. And so when these commands, this command was given, it was given in that context. And even today, you'll hear um, um, many... Um, despising the authority in that sense. Defund the police, I think, is a, a chief example currently. Um, despising the authority uh, and wanting to cast their cords off from them, right? Uh, defund the police is a good example. Rome, again, one of the most repressive, oppressive regimes in human history. Um, so Paul, in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, I think it's important to remember that Paul is not speaking only of good or benevolent authorities. Um, Paul is speaking of repressive, ungodly authorities. However, the more repressive or oppressive or tyrannical the government is, the more important it is that a Christian understand their responsibility to be subject, right? The more tyrannical a government becomes, the more important it is that we're clear on what be subject means and that we have a heart disposition to be submissive uh, even when government uh, oversteps their bounds. Uh, the flood waters, um, waters flood into another sphere of jurisdiction. Uh, we need to understand what that be subject means. Okay, that's the imperative, right? Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Let's talk about the indicative or this uh, statement, this assertion of truth, okay? For... Or because there is, no, there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Right? There is no authority except from God. The authorities that exist are appointed by God. That is a statement of fact. That's the indicative. We go from imperative. Paul begins with the imperative and then gives the reason why. Right? The indicative. Okay? 
God being sovereign, all authority is given or delegated authority. All authority is given authority or delegated authority, derived authority. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ has been given all authority. All authority begins with him, finds its source in him, belongs to him. And so any authority that exists in our context is a given authority, a delegated authority, a derived authority. It comes from him, okay? And that comes with significant implications we're going to talk about. All governmental authorities, all civil authorities are ordained. They are decreed, established by God. They receive their power. They receive their authority from God himself. Now, we're to understand this uh, in the context of something we've talked about before, which is the doctrine of concurrence, okay? Um, all authority derives its authority from God. What about wicked authorities? Our government is a wicked government. They execute wicked laws. They do wicked things. They behave wickedly. They're made up of people who are uh, absolutely um, devoid of the things of God, hate the things of God, want to eradicate any notion of God from the public sphere altogether, right? It's not a godly government. Um, other governments in world history have been unbelievably tyrannical and deadly and horrific. Uh, so um, how are we to understand those governments relative to this statement of Paul that all authority is given by God. The governing authorities that exist are appointed by God, right? This is understood within something we've talked about, the doctrine of concurrence, okay? We know that the Bible teaches, the Bible clearly teaches that God works all things after the counsel of his own will. Our statement of faith says that God determines all things whatsoever that comes to pass. Um, God is sovereign in that way. All things that come to pass, God decrees, okay? God is sovereign um, working all things, not some things, <laughs> all things after the counsel of his own will. How you did your hair this morning, all right? Whether you brushed your teeth or forgot, right? <laughs> um, there's, everything is encompassed under that statement. So then into that, that doesn't eradicate or negate the fact that we make decisions ourselves. We, have, we make free moral decisions, okay? Uh, free uh, in one sense, not free in another. And God uses secondary causes then to bring about his will. God, in our statement of faith, says that God doesn't do violence to man's will. God uses secondary causes to bring about his will. And that's how these things fit together, right? Um, we would call it free moral agency or the responsibility of man, the culpability of man for his own sin, combined with in relation to the absolute sovereignty of God over all things whatsoever that come to pass. And these things are married. They're not um, two separate contradictory things. We're, we're trying somehow to fit together. No, they are fit together. These things are married. Uh, the Bible describes, um, I think, the, the way that we can understand how the Bible marries those two together, how they are married, is through something called the doctrine of concurrence. God uses secondary causes to bring his will about, not God is not the direct author of evil. James says that God, does, God tempts no one to evil. But what men mean for evil, God doesn't simply use for good. God determines for good. God intends for good. Remember, God is absolutely sovereign over all things whatsoever that come to pass. And so when... Um, Joseph makes that statement in Exodus chapter 50 to his brothers, right? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Um, God determines, God intends, God decrees all things whatsoever that come to pass. And he um, wields, as it were, in his sovereign power, even the wicked free moral choices of men to accomplish his purposes and ends. So whatever secondary causes then God uses to bring authorities to power, God is sovereign over those authorities coming to power. So let's flesh this out a little bit, and I want to give you an opportunity to ask questions. Um, God can use a lawful election to bring his authority to power, or God may use an unlawful election to bring his authority to his decreed civil authority to power. God may use a hostile takeover <laughs> to bring his 
decreed or ordained authority to power. God may use insurrection. God may use war. God may use revolution. God may use political deceit to bring the civil authority that he has decreed uh, to power. God may use heredity, right? We've seen that in governments around the world. Uh, God may use foreign invasion, <laughs> but in whatever respect, whatever secondary cause God determines to use, it is God who is bringing that civil authority to power. Paul's statement, Romans chapter 13, verse one, there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. It's simply clear, right? Very clear what Paul is saying. And we're, we're not gonna get around that statement with gymnastics over you know, free will and all that kind of stuff, right? God, through secondary causes, determines what comes to pass, including civil authorities, and he brings those civil authorities um, into existence, so to speak, by his own determined will and foreordained purpose. And he can use whatever secondary cause he determines to use. So um, most recently, uh, there are many um, who look at that election as a complete farce, uh, understandably so. Um, but bear in mind, God is sovereign over those authorities that exist. They are appointed by God, whether you think the election was fair and legitimate or whether you think the election was unfair and illegitimate. Um, men get what they deserve, all right? <laughs> um, we have the government that God has appointed for us to have because God is sovereign over the government that we have, okay? That government is established by and established with the authority of God himself. The government that we have established by and with the authority of God himself. Let me give you some instances from scripture. Uh, one passage that comes to mind immediately is Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. Right? God's sovereign over the king's heart. We remember from scripture, um, let's look at a couple of these quickly. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 10, look at Isaiah chapter 10 with me. In Isaiah chapter 10, the, the Lord brings the Assyrians to power, and that is by the direct agency of God Almighty. Uh, God himself brings the Assyrians to power. Rome, uh, Isaiah chapter 10, beginning in verse... Five. Look at verse five. He's now going to profess a, a prophesied judgment against Assyria for all that they've done. It's amazing to me. Uh, God will bring forth a country like this to judge his own people, to judge Israel. That country is a wicked country. That country in their wickedness is going to attack Israel. And then God in his just and righteous judgment will turn and judge that wicked co country for their sin against his people. Divine concurrence. God in infinite wisdom bringing about his decreed ends. Okay, verse five. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. Assyria is the rod of God's anger. He holds it in his hands, so to speak, and he wields it against his own people. You see? The, uh, the uh, people of Israel. And the staff, Assyria, is the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him, Assyria, against an ungodly nation, against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets." In other words, Assyria is appointed by God to do God's will in pouring out judgment on Israel, okay? Yet, he, Assyria, does not mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. Isn't that fascinating, right? In the heart and mind of Assyria, the kings of Assyria, the leaders of Assyria, they're not thinking to themselves, we are going to do the will of God, we're going to attack Israel. We're going to bring judgment upon Israel. We're doing the work of God. They're not thinking of that at all. In their minds, they're a pagan, idolatrous, wicked nation. They're, in their minds, doing evil. But what they mean for evil, God has determined for good. What's the good that God is going to get from the nation of Assyria? Pouring out judgment on the nation of Israel. You see? 
For he says, verse 8, Assyria says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Cano uh, like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arphad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of, of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? Amazing, isn't it? Therefore it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem that he will say then, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, by the strength of my hand I have done it and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also I have removed the boundaries of the people, removed their uh, landmarks, right? And I have robbed, he's taken their property. I have robbed their treasuries. I've put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found like a nest the riches of the people. As one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there's no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. Well, shall the, the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up, or as if a staff could lift up as it were, as it were not wood. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones, famine. Under his glory, he will kindle a burning, like the burning of a fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire and his holy one for a flame. He, it will burn and devour his thorns, his briars in one day. They will consume the glory of the forest. Sorry, he goes on and on uh, with that um, concerning Assyria. Right? We can think of other examples from scripture. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter four is another example. God gives kingdoms to whom he wishes. Uh, he can raise them up and cast them down. If you read through the book of Daniel, Daniel is a, a bit of an exposition on this particular subject, right? Uh, Daniel chapter 5, you have the, um, the wicked king Belshazzar and the story there of Belshazzar's feast. Uh, you've been weighed, you've been numbered, you've been weighed, you've been found wanting. Uh, and God is going to cast you down. And in that very night, the kingdom is ripped from him, given to a godly nation who's going to rule for you. no given to the Medes and the Persians, right? God sends the Chaldeans. Um, the, if, as you get to Daniel chapter 7 and the four kingdoms that are uh, we see, um, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9, those are king, kingdoms and run by tin horn dictators, you know, uh, in those kingdoms. And they're raised up and torn down by the sovereign will of God. And all of those kingdoms pointing to, leading up to the everlasting kingdom that will never be destroyed, that will also be established in permanence by the sovereign work of God, right? Uh, God raises up Cyrus. Now we see Cyrus, um, in Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Cyrus, and Isaiah 44, God calls Cyrus. Before Cyrus was even a flicker on anybody's radar, God is calling him by name in the book of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah. Absolutely amazing, right? Turn with me to Habakkuk. Habakkuk. And look at Habakkuk chapter 1. Verse 1, Habakkuk is having difficulty, not unlike Psalm 73 we read a couple of weeks ago, having difficulty with the wicked, right? Pervasive wickedness in the land. He's crying out. He's um, in despair, uh, distress over this wickedness. And God uh, is going to raise up the Chaldeans to judge the Israelites. So by God's direct agency for the purpose of judgment, serving God's purposes, God is going to raise up the Chaldeans. Look at verse 5. Look, God says to Habakkuk, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty, na I wanted to say nasty, that's what it looked like, <laughs> my eyesight's not that good, they're both, they're both hasty and nasty, 
uh, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards, more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings. Princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold. They heap up earth and mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes and he transgresses. Right? He commits offense, ascribing this power to his little g God. Right? This idolatrous nature. He doesn't realize, the Chaldeans don't realize that they are a rod in the hand of God. Uh, and God will judge them for their sin also. From the Assyrians to the Babylonians to the Medes and the Persians to the Chaldeans to the Hitlers and the Stalins in our own day. There is no authority except from God, Paul says, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And we know that they're appointed by God with a divine purpose, a divine end in mind. Uh, God working out all things for the good of his own people uh, and maybe judgment upon the lost, maybe chastening upon his own people, right? But God working all things out according to his own will. Divine concurrence. God accomplishing his will through them, whatever they think or suppose that they are doing, God is working out his divine will through them. Um, they are a secondary cause. Even when they abuse the authority, that they've been given, that's been delegated them by God, and they often do, even when they abuse that authority uh, to do evil, what they mean for evil, God has determined for good. On the basis of their God-given authority, on the basis of their appointment by God according to his will, that's the um, indicative. Paul says, verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. That's the resulting imperative. Okay? Questions? Um, how should Christians look at the American Revolutionary War mm -hmm. since Britain, the British at that time were ruling? Yeah, that, that, that would be a good series of Sunday school classes <laughs> to talk about that. I, um, you know, in thinking about this subject, uh, and I'll give you a, a quick answer, brother. Maybe we can talk more about it. Um, but in thinking about this subject, um, there were people, Christians, um, many of them, who fled persecution in Europe, um, various um, circumstances of persecution against Christians and came to this country for freedom to worship and to serve God as they saw fit. Our founding fathers in um, beginning to conceive of a government here um, thought to establish a government that would protect those rights um, they came here uh, and established their own families, their own property, their own livelihood. And in my personal opinion, uh, thinking through that, what you have in uh, England at the time is a tyrannical invading uh, army, invading country, uh, wanting to, at the point of a sword, take that from them. Um, so the, the, um, we'll get into that more when we talk about how our government was set up, but, um, their initial cry of, um, taxation without representation was a part of that. Um, um, they have, we have right to life, uh, to liberty, inalienable rights to property and what our declaration of independence referred to as the pursuit of happiness. And, um, those God given, not government given, but God given rights, were being taken. And so I think, um, and we'll talk about this more in the future, but a Christian under those circumstances, uh, they have um, certain opportunities available to them, right? The, um, the, the first is to resist, uh, to protest, right? To protest. So in England, um, in the Netherlands, um, France, they were protesting um, after the Reformation or at the time of the Reformation, 
and continuing on. Uh, many of them were killed, persecuted, burned at the stake, hunted down, uh, churches closed. Uh, and so the protest didn't work, quote unquote, in many cases. And so the, the, the Christian then, the second opportunity available to the Christian is to flee, to flee persecution. We should flee persecution. So what did they do? The Huguenots fled, right? The, um, the particular Baptists in England uh, fled and fled to America, you know, fled to the, the new land <laughs> and um, the new world. And when they fled, they were hunted down and followed. And then what is a Christian to do if protest doesn't work, if fleeing is no longer an option, then I think the, um, the, the responsibility, the right of a Christian in that circumstance is to fight. And so I, I, I see personally, these are my own thoughts on it, and I'll, uh, maybe we can flesh that out more later, is that the American Revolution was a just defense of life and liberty on the part of those who lived here, who came here for freedom to worship God as they saw fit according to the Bible. And they were protecting their own life, liberty, and property against tyranny. And so um, I would have considered, I would consider the American Revolution a just application of those biblical principles. At some point, I think those three things hold fast, right? The, the, the Christian can protest, um, past protest. The Christian can um, flee, flee persecution. And after fleeing, I think we, at some point, you have to fight. You have to defend. You're defending your own family. Uh, you're defending God's God-given inalienable rights. And you're doing that against tyranny. Tyranny is a satanic device, uh, not a God-wielded uh, device. Um, so I think it's incumbent upon Christians at some point at some point to fight. That's in, in, in Schaefer's book, uh, Christian Manifesto, he talks about wrestling with where that line is. And I think that Christians should wrestle with where those lines are. And we'll do that as part of this study together, wrestle some with where that line is. But at some point, I think it becomes right to, right to fight. Help? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Peter says something similar. Oh, question? Oh, thank you, brother. Sorry. Yes, the, the secondary causes uh, can, uh, and free will, mm -hmm. are those connected in terms of how God brings about what he wants. You know, I wasn't too clear on that. Yeah, thank you, brother. Thank, um, yes, so um, uh, we um, act freely. <laughs> um, I make decisions, and the decisions that I make are... Uh, decisions for which I'm responsible. I'm held culpable. I'm um, responsible for the decisions I make. And so this, this notion of free will that some um, unhelpful Calvinists will propose that, that we have zero free will, we have no free will, I think is very unhelpful. Um, our, we make free moral decisions on a regular basis, decisions for which we're held responsible, but our wills are in bondage, enslaved to sin. The scripture is really clear about that. It's like a, a man in a, in a prison cell, for example, right? He's free to make decisions, but he's not getting out of the prison cell, right? He's, he's making free moral decisions within the four walls of that cell. Our wills are in bondage to sin. So we um, make decisions and while all the while our natures are corrupted by sin, enslaved to sin. And so our um, moral wills are in bondage, so to speak. But as we make decisions um, and being responsible for our own decisions, God uses even those decisions to accomplish his will, right? Those become uh, a direct cause would be if God did the thing himself, right? Um, direct moral agency. Um, God, God, um, it would make God the author of sin, so to speak, but God uses the free moral agency of man or uses secondary causes in that sense to accomplish his own will such that what Joseph's brothers meant for evil against him, God meant for good to save many lives. It's, um, that issue of secondary causes. God's not the author of sin, doesn't tempt anyone to sin, but God will use the sin of man to accomplish his own purposes. Uh, and that's what divine concurrence and secondary causes deals with. That helps. So, okay. Um, we're out of time this morning. I want to uh, give you this from Peter. First Peter chapter two, verse 13. 
Peter says, therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And it's for the Lord's sake. His honor is concerned with the dutiful, responsible behavior of subjects to their sovereign, right? And so we as Christians are to submit ourselves to governing authorities. Okay, we're going to pick up there next week and talk about that in more detail. If you have questions, please uh, let me know. Happy to help. And uh, we'll keep going in Romans. This will make more sense as we work through the text, okay? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, very grateful to you, Lord, um, for your word, grateful for this book of Romans. Uh, what a joy it is, Lord, to, to spend time in this book together and to learn from it. Please help us to understand these things. And as we go, uh, cultivate within us, uh, illumine our hearts and minds, cultivate within us an understanding of our relationship to the governing authorities which you appoint. And help us, Lord, to um, first and foremost, uh, without compromise, be faithful to you in how we relate to them. Uh, that's our object here in thinking through these things is to uh, be ultimately faithful to you, even in the, the, the disposition of our hearts, uh, this willingness to be submissive to the authorities which you appoint. Help us, Lord, as we think through these things for your glory, God, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. God bless you.